Good morning, church. If you'll turn in your hymnals to number eight, we gather together. This song has traditionally been a uh, Thanksgiving song, but it's also one to honor veterans. And today is Veterans Day. So how many veterans do we have in the audience? Let's have you stand up. Thank you. This song was written about 400 years ago to commemorate the Netherlands' uh, freedom from the Spaniards, which happened around the end of the 16th century. Interestingly, it was the tune, which is a Netherlands folk song, was found by Edward Kremser, who was a, the director of a male voice singing society in Vienna. And he arranged this and brought it into our uh, modern day. So we think it's uh, appropriate that a men's voice group is leading this song today. So we honor our veterans and thank God for our freedom. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessing. He chastens and hastens his will to make known the wicked oppressing. Now cease from distressing. Sing praises to his name. He forgets not his own. Beside us to guide us, our God with us joining, ordaining, maintaining his kingdom divine. So from the beginning, the fight we were winning, now Lord was at our side, all glory be thine. We The next song is not in your hymnal, but it should be on the board. Thank you, Lord. I'm sure you'll recognize the chorus, but uh, we're going to sing the verses, too. This was written by Mr. and Mrs. Seth Sykes, who were Scottish evangelists. And the song was written in 1940. Some for 
sweet salvation so rich and free. I trust in Him from day to day. I prove His saving grace. I'll sing this song of praise to Him until I see is to number 100 in your hymnals, Great is Thy Faithfulness. This song was written a hundred years ago, and the author of the words, uh, Thomas Chisholm, gave them to a co-worker of his, William Runyon, and asked him to compose a melody for it. Uh, Mr. Runyon prayed. He read the words and thought this is an inspiring hymn and he prayed to the Lord to give him a song that would match the words that would bring out the meaning and so I think you'll agree that the Lord answered that prayer so we're singing a song that was inspired by the Lord both in the words and in the music let's sing together great is thy faithfulness One thing I need to tell you, when we come to the last chorus, the last time through it, great is thy faithfulness, we'll repeat that three times, so follow us. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father, there is no shadow of turning with thee. Great is thy faithfulness, great is 
Good morning, everybody. So glad you're here today on this beautiful day to praise the Lord Jesus and to invite him into our hearts and minds right now and just uh, know the presence of Jesus as he promised to be here with us. To those who are joining us online from wherever you are, uh, welcome. We're glad you're here and, and we want to just invite you to be a part of this worship service uh, every Saturday morning at this time. And uh, this uh, is a special day for our church because this is our annual sacrifice offering day for, for reaching unreached people groups in the United States and around the world. And so uh, we're just uh, joining the worldwide uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church in making this a very special day for this special annual offering. War Room, you're invited to be a part of a special 15-minute prayer group starts in the Thrive Room down the hall about 10 minutes after the worship service concludes. Each Sabbath, uh, walking with Jesus in the last days, uh, you're invited to come to this Friday evening. It's just a nice way to start the Sabbath together, do some Bible study together, eat some hot uh, soup together, and just a good, good fellowship there in the Friendship Center. Journey to Bethlehem, we've got a work bee tomorrow. The, our start date for actual journey to Bethlehem is coming up, to, and so we need lots of help tomorrow to get, help get things ready for our big four days, December 1, 2, 3, and 4. Uh, there's a request here that you please check the most recent update to the directory that's there in the foyer uh, to just make sure that your information is updated and correct as we're putting out a new uh, uh, edition of our church directory. We need a webmaster for our church. Our one webmaster up and left us and went down to Medford, Oregon. And so uh, we, if you are uh, someone that's familiar with the internet and, and uh, maybe even knowing how to uh, create a website or revise a website, we'd, I'd like to talk to you and see. We're, uh, some information is there in your bulletin. Uh, the 2024 devotional books are available uh, now for order from the Adventist Book Center. And uh, this one is a brand new one called The Shepherd King by David Metzler. There are many, many other options. There's ones for kids, there's ones for teens, there's ones for young adults. There's uh, a women's devotional written by women, for women. Uh, just a great way to have a, a, a time for a Bible text, a Bible re, a message, an inspirational message uh, at the beginning of each day for the entire year. Now, just a little tip. Uh, the Adventist Book Center is giving free shipping, free shipping on two days, things that are ordered on November 26 and November 27. So we'll put that in the bulletin next week. Uh, but just so you know ahead of time, if you want to save on the postage also. Uh, now, we have some pictures to show on the screen. And uh, this is from our food bank. And we have a brand new wrap on the uh, food bank truck. There it is, just this week, brand new. Uh, there's the back of it. And uh, helping families in need at food bank. I think there's one more picture. Yes, beautiful picture of our church, our grounds. Uh, 
and George Waymeyer took the picture for us in high resolution, and there it is on the side of our truck. So we're really excited about this. I just want to have a special thank you to our food bank manage, uh, office managers, Jackie and Fred Thompson, to uh, our distribution manager, Gary Karpenko, and to also to our recently retired food bank director, uh, Marianne Reisenhoover, and all the volunteers. Uh, this is going to be a real witness for Jesus all around this town, and it looks beautiful, and I just think it's a fantastic uh, update, and I think we're talking about wrapping the other truck here pretty soon as well. So, uh, praise God for that. So, uh, let's just praise God together with uh, our hymn, uh, our praise, number 617, We Are Living, We Are Dwelling. Let's sing it together. with me. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that the victory is assured as long as we keep our hand in yours. And Lord, we know that this enemy that is mentioned in this song is powerless before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, our Lord Jesus Christ. But he is a master deceiver and we will fail if we don't stick with Jesus every minute of every day. Lord, I pray that your holy presence through the Holy Spirit will fill this place even now and touch our hearts and strengthen us for the battle ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Be seated, please.
Thank you for singing with us this morning. It was inspiring listening to this congregation sing with such fervor and gusto. We appreciate that. This morning's offering is, as Pastor Harry mentioned earlier today, the annual sacrifice offering. Will you sacrifice for mission? Global mission pioneers are the unsung heroes of Adventist mission. Around the world today, hundreds and of these lay people go to the unentered areas and church groups to start new Seventh-day Adventist congregations. Many of the places where they begin to work are areas where the church has never had a presence. But nobody has told the pioneers that they can't do it. So on a small living stipend, they go and live among the people and put Christ's method of ministry into practice. They mingle with the people in various ways, in the rice fields, playing soccer with kids, in the cities. They show sympathy and minister to the needs of the, in very practical ways. And pioneers embed themselves, just like Jesus did, in, uh, incarnationally into the community. They sacrifice their time and efforts to live simply and bring others into a loving relationship with God. Historically, the annual sacrifice offering has come at the end of, the week of, a, of a week of prayer. And I know we just had a week of prayer up at the school, up at Yakima Adventist Christian School, and I understand that it was a very well received by the students. And it, this is now our opportunity to give generously to support the mission of this church around this world. So please give generously to this important offering. There are three ways you can donate. You can mail your check in, your donation check in. You can go online to adventistgiving.org, uh, and that's very convenient, or we have a box out in the foyer uh, that you can drop your, your envelope in. Let's pray. Dear Lord, please help us to sacrifice something that we really don't need and contribute its value to the annual sacrifice offering. We are so blessed in this country, even though our country's in much turmoil, as the rest of the world is as well, but we are blessed to be able to live and worship freely, and we pray that the funds that are given will go to help spread your gospel, because we do want to go home soon. We ask these things in your name, amen. All right, boys and girls, your turn. You can just get right up out of your seats and go to the back of each of the aisles. Come quickly forward with your Joash offering for the scholarships at Yakima Adventist Christian School. There's a beautiful picture of our school with the rainbow, double rainbow, over the school. That's a beautiful reminder that God is blessing our students and teachers at Yakima Adventist Christian School. And one of the teachers from our school, Carol Hartzell, will be sharing a story with you. So you can sit right on the steps.
first have a question. How many of you guys like to ride a bicycle? Do you guys like to ride bicycles? I'm gonna tell you a story about when I was little. My sister and I used to love to ride our bicycles, except for they weren't really bicycles, because bicycles have two wheels, and ours were tricycles. They had three wheels, one in the front and two in the back, and we loved, loved to ride our tricycles around. And I think I was maybe about four, maybe five years old, and my sister was about two, maybe three years old, and we loved to play this game on our tricycles. It was great. One of us would ride in the front, and the other one of us would ride in the back, and then the front one would stop suddenly, and the one in the back would whack right into the back of the front one. And we thought that was so fun. It was great. And we'd ride, and then I'd stop. And my sister would ram into the back of me, and I'd whoa. And then we'd trade places, and she'd ride, and she'd stop, and I'd walk right into the back of her, and she'd go whoa. And then we'd do it all over again, and my mom would come out and say, girls, someone's going to get hurt. You guys don't do that. And we'd go, okay, mommy. And then she'd go inside and we'd ride real fast. And the first one would stop and the second one, whoomp, right into the back. And she'd say again, girls, stop. Someone's going to get hurt. Okay, mommy. And then we'd go back out and we'd, we'd do it again because it was so fun. And then there was this time, and I was riding, and I stopped, and something caught my attention. I looked away, and my sister didn't stop because we were playing a game, right? And she'd walk right into the back of me, and instead of going, I went, whomp. And I fell over onto the sidewalk, and oh, that hurt. And I hit my head. Oh, and that really hurt. And then I sat up. Oh, wow, I think I saw stars, and I went like this, I went, oh, mommy. And I moved my hand, and my sister looked at me, and she said it a lot louder, mom. And my mom came running, and you know why my sister yelled? Because I was bleeding. And how many of you have had a, an owie on your head that bleeds? They bleed, and they bleed, and they bleed, and they look like they're really bad. And my mom was a nurse, and she came up, and she picked me up, and she wasn't scared. And she carried me inside, and she cleaned me up, and she put some ice. And you know what? My mommy could have said, I told you not to do that, and you're just going to have to deal with it. But do you think my mama did that? No, she didn't. She took me in, and she held me while I cried, and she cleaned me up, and she took care of me. I couldn't go back outside and play, though, because my head hurt. So I was stuck inside. That kind of stunk. I didn't like that at all. But you know what? She, she was very loving, and she took care of me. She did say, well, girls, that's why I told you not to do that. But you know what? I thought, wow. That's so much like Jesus. You know, Jesus tells us, he says, don't do that. You might get hurt. And sometimes we go, oh, okay. And sometimes we go do it again. And we get hurt. And you know what? Jesus doesn't come to us and say, I told you not to do that. He picks us up and he takes us and he helps us get better and he loves us. And he does remind us, See, I told you, I want the best for you. Please listen, but he does love us and take care of us. You can go back to your seats. Let's kneel together as we pray. Our
Our Father in heaven, we have come into your presence this morning with joy and thanksgiving. Thankful for Jesus and for what he has done to save our souls. Thankful to the Holy Spirit for attending us each moment and guiding us in the way of righteousness. Thankful to you because you are eternal and you have created all things and you have created us to have fellowship with you. We praise you for that privilege. And today on your Sabbath, may each of us experience that warm fellowship and connection with you and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We want to lift up those that are in other areas of the world where difficulties are persisting. We pray that you will intervene and bring peace Relieve those that are being oppressed. Show us how we can do that in our own neighborhoods and locality. We want to lift up those that have asked for prayer in our bulletin and for those that are in other churches around the world. You know each need and you know each praise. And we pray that your blessing will be on each of those that have asked for help or those that are expressing praise. We pray that you will bless Pastor Harry as he brings the message that you have given him this morning. Give him an extra portion of your spirit and bless us with that spirit that we may understand and incorporate into our thoughts and our way of life the message that you have for us. Thank you again for bringing us together in fellowship and praise and for blessing us with salvation. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen.
You know what? Sacrifice is uncomfortable. Sacrifice is uncomfortable. You know, we like the happy stories, right? But real sacrifice is uncomfortable. I mean, it was painfully uncomfortable for Abraham and then later for Isaac as the shock of human sacrifice stunned their minds. But when by faith they were willing to sacrifice all, then God brought the deliverance, right? There's a lesson for us here. God blesses uncomfortable sacrifice. It was frighteningly uncomfortable for the Phoenician widow to give away the last food she had for her young son to this stranger. But God's promise through Elijah came true and it saved them all from starvation. Lesson for us? Yes, God builds our faith through sacrifice. You know, it was a difficult and uncomfortable decision for the impoverished widow to drop her last two pennies into the offering box at the temple there in AD 31. But Jesus himself saw it and praised her and God provided for her needs. You know, in God's economy, in God's economy, the amount sacrificed always supersedes the amount given. What was that? In God's economy, the amount sacrificed always supersedes the amount given. Uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not, that's quite a collection of all kinds of things, but one of the items there was just a plain bar of iron, just a simple plain bar. That, at that time, about $5. But if it was made into horseshoes, it would be worth maybe about $50. And if that same bar of iron was made into needles, it could be worth about $5,000. And if manufactured into the balance springs of a fine Swiss watch, Swiss watches, it could be worth up to $500,000. So the raw material is not as important as how it's developed, right? The Holy Spirit gives each of us spiritual gifts and resources, but their worth will depend on how we develop them. So how are you and how am I developing our sacrificial love? You know, we need to offer ourselves entirely to Jesus each day, don't we? You know, Abram and a small band of trained servants made an uncomfortable sacrifice. That was a decision to probably be willing to die in battle trying to rescue Lot and his family from thousands of fierce Mesopotamian warriors. So this is a true story, a, a story of sacrifice and a story of, of thanksgiving. So turn in your Bible to Genesis chapter 13. We'll start at verse 11. Genesis chapter 13, uh, this pretty amazing story. Abram and Lot, they separate, they go to their different places to live. You know, Abram generously sacrificed by allowing Lot to choose his home place first, right? Right? And then the wickedness and homosexual violence of Sodom. It was the reason that God allowed Sodom and Gomorrah to be defeated in this story and then later to be totally destroyed by fire. Genesis chapter 13 verses 14 through 18 says this. So Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out toward the east, and the two men parted company. Abram lived in the land of Canaan, while Lot lived in the cities of the plain and pitched his tents near Sodom. Now, the people of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against the Lord. Verse 14, then the Lord said to Abram after Lot had parted from him, look, look. 
Look around from where you are to the north and the south, the east and the west. All the land that you see I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring could be counted. Go, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I am giving it to you. So Abram went to live near the great trees of Mamre at Hebron, where he pitched his tents, and there he built an altar to the Lord. So here we have Abram. God blessed Abram's sacrifice. Abram continued to follow God to uh, follow his leading. He believed in God's promises, even though they were so like beyond imagination. He believed in the promises, and he worshiped and obeyed the Creator, uh, even amid the immoral pagan society that he was living there in Canaan. Now, we, the story continues. Uh, Genesis chapter 14, <clears throat> verses 1 and 2. Uh, let's see how we do with all these names. Uh, Genesis chapter 14, verse 1. And at the time when Amraphel was king of Shinar, and Arioch was king of Elisar, and Ked or Laamar was the king of Elam, and Tidal was the king of Goim, these kings went to war against Bera, the king of what? Sodom, and Bersha, the king of Gomorrah, and other uh, neighboring cities. So, here we have this story. It's a big army against some fairly small walled cities there in the uh, Dead Sea Valley, the Jordan Valley. And so we have these four powerful kings banding together to capture Sodom and nearby city-states. Now, not only did they capture and defeat Sodom, they forced the inhabitants of Sodom to work as slaves and pay exorbitant taxes for 12 years. Now, after the first year, that was probably plenty enough. But two years, three years, four years, 10 years, 12 years, and finally the people rebelled. The people of Sodom gathered to their uh, allies together and they said, let's, let's fight back. We don't have to be slaves anymore. And then the Sodom Confederacy rebelled. They, they again uh, watched to see what would happen. And yep, there they came again. That great eastern army, the army from the east, marching across the Euphrates River and attacked Sodom again. And again Sodom lost. And Lot and his whole family this time were grabbed, probably tied up, and kidnapped as prisoners of war. I don't know what it's like to be a prisoner of war. But I just heard a story by Pastor Fred Riffle at our week of prayer at school where he talked about his own father, his own father, who was a prisoner of war in, for three whole years in a Japanese prison camp in the Philippines. And it was a terrible time. Many hundreds of their fellow prisoners died of starvation, malnutrition, uh, and all the horrors of, of war. So, uh, what was Abram to do? Uh, what could he do with just a few hundred servants against the thousands of ruthless warriors? What, what, what was he to do? Genesis chapter 14, verse 11. The four kings seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. And then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew Lot and his possessions since he was living in Sodom. A man who had escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. And now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, a brother of Eshcol and Anur, and all of whom were allied with Abram. So Abram thinks he can go after the great combined armies of the east? You're kidding. But he didn't hesitate. Despite the risk, he didn't hesitate. You know, love sacrifices, right? Love sacrifices. Love takes risks for the benefits of others. 
And with only 318 servants and a few neighbors, Abram, now he's about 80 years old, led his band of men in pursuit for more than 180 miles to the north, probably by foot, hoping to somehow free Lot and his family. Genesis chapter 14, verse 14. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit of them as far as Dan. During the night, Abram divided his men to attack them, and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. He recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions together with the women and the other people. This is amazing. This is a very small band. This is like Gideon's band winning the war against the huge army. Amazing war story. Amazing victory that was orchestrated by God. Complete success. Lot, his wife, his, his children, plus all the captives from Sodom are free. And the news spreads very quickly through the land of Canaan. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, or Jerusalem, Jerusalem, set out to meet this amazing man of faith, Genesis chapter 14, verse 18, the story continues. Then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High God, and he blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be, the, be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and praise be to God Most High, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Incredibly, this Canaanite king is a believer in Yahweh the true God of Israel, the, the creator of heaven and earth. And he's, he's not just a believer. He is also not only a king, but he's the priest, a priest of true worship of the true God. And when they discovered that both of them worshiped the same God, Abram gave up one-tenth of all the spoils and he gave them to the priest king Melchizedek as tithe of, in thankfulness to God for the victory that God had, had given them, this miraculous victory. Now, Melchizedek also praised God, as we just read. He recognized this amazing feat was an act of God, an act of Jehovah. Now, I think this might be called one of the first Veterans Day, Thanksgiving Day combinations in history, wouldn't you say? I mean, this is amazing. And just to think, think of the significance of this. Abraham. Abraham becomes the great symbol of faith in the coming Messiah. And then Melchizedek becomes the great symbol of the Messiah himself. The, the, uh, the symbol of Jesus, the priest king. The symbol of Jesus who gave his life on the cross for us. So God blesses uncomfortable sacrifice. And the result is praise and thanksgiving and joy. You know, the battle had recently ended. I mean, that is the final battle of the Revolutionary War. British Major General Cornwallis was surrounded at Yorktown, Virginia. I've been there, visited the place. Uh, it was a fort, and uh, Cornwallis had taken over this, this fort. And now George, General George Washington was coming down from the north with his troops, and the uh, French Navy had blockaded the port there at Yorktown and hemmed in uh, Cornwallis and his men. And the, then the... Uh, the uh, revolutionary soldiers surrounded the fort, and uh, Cornwallis knew that it was time to run the, up the white flag. And so he ran up a white flag in surrender, and the Revolutionary War, the American Revolutionary War, was over. It was done. It was done. The, the, the final peace treaty was signed September 3, 1783. Uh, God had brought into existence a new nation predicted in Revelation's prophecy, built on the foundation of civil and religious freedom. And in President George Washington's first presidential proclamation, 
he called for a national day of thanksgiving and prayer for the battle won, for God's peace and guidance on November 26, 1789. Here's what he said. Here was his first presidential proclamation. I just toured George Washington's home just a few weeks ago there at Mount Vernon uh, in northern Virginia. And uh, listen to this and sound, see if you think that this man is a Christian. Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly implore His protection and favor. And whereas both houses of Congress have by their joint committee requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many signal favors of Almighty God, especially by affording them an opportunity peaceably to establish a form of government for their safety and happiness. Now, therefore, I do recommend and assign Thursday the 26th day of November next to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the beneficent author of all good that was, that is, and that will be. George Washington, October 3, 1789. You know, on this Veterans Day, today is Veterans Day, right? 11, 11. How many of you have served in the armed forces of the United States. Raise your hand high if you have at some time served in the armed forces of the United States. A number of you have. And so I just say to you who have served your country, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for your service. Uh, thank you for being willing to, uh, to go. And we, I just, uh, I, I'm also thinking of those who served as non-combatants who are willing to risk their lives to save others. But friends, the war is not over yet. The war is not over yet. The epic battle between Jesus Christ and our arch enemy, Satan the deceiver, rages on even stronger than ever. His ability to deceive even the most intelligent people through the internet or through our society's pressures and fads is more powerful than ever. Satan goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may destroy. But often, we don't really hear his roar, right? He's a master of deception. He's a master of cover-up. Uh, he does it subtly through peer pressure, through myriad electronic media and, and family pressures and all kinds of other pressures. The only way that you will not be deceived and lost forever is by studying this book and putting its teachings into practice in your life with faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. You will be deceived unless you know and study this book because Satan is out there with a million fakes, false, falsehoods, but we only have one true source of truth, God's holy word, the Bible. Yes, in the strength of Jesus, we can live a counter-cultural life of caring and conviction and thanksgiving and obedience to our Creator. That's what we're called to be, what we're called to do as Christians. Jesus sacrificed. He sacrificed His life so that you can live. And now He empowers you to sacrifice for the good of others. Turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15 and 16 he reveal here three ways that we can give sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. So, let's see what the Bible says here. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Uh, Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise. Sacrifice of thanksgiving. The fruit of lips that openly profess his name. And do not forget to do good and to share with others. For with such a sacrifice, God is pleased. So uh, how do we give a sacrifice of 
praise, a sacrifice of thanksgiving uh, in the coming weeks? Well, first, with the fruit of our lips. In other words, our words. Of verbally praising God in our prayers. And openly professing, as it says here, openly professing our faith in His name in our conversations with others. That's giving a sacrifice of praise. Second, do good. <laughs> it's pretty simple. Do good. Do your neighbors and co-workers and relatives know you as a person who cares and helps? Are you regularly volunteering to help others? Third, verse 16, share with others. Share with us. Are you sharing what you have with others, both physically and spiritually? The Bible gives us two additional ways to offer uh, sacrifices of thanksgiving. Uh, one is in 1 Samuel 15, verse 22. Verse 22 says, But Samuel replied to King Saul, does the Lord delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as much as in obeying the Lord? To obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams, for rebellion is like the sin of divination, witchcraft, and the arrogance is like the evil of idolatry. Because you, Saul, have rejected the word of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. Wow. An uh, epic moment in earth's history. Someone just got fired, right? It was the king of Israel. Why? Because he was on his own agenda, unwilling to obey and follow God. Obedience to God's instruction is a sacrifice that God values very highly as we read this passage, you know, are you living out the truth you know? Are your eyes seeing only what is pure and true and, and noble? Are you enjoying keeping the Sabbath holy? The fifth way that we can offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving is in Romans 12, verse 1. And it says here that we have uh, an opportunity to do something all the time. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So worship isn't just here on Sabbath morning. Worship is how we live our lives. And so that's what God's asking us to do, to give a, a, the best sacrifice. The best sacrifice of thanks is our whole life dedicated to Christ, to serve Christ every day. That's the best sacrifice of praise. As the song asks, have you been praying for Christ's returning? Have you told someone of saving grace? Are you committed? Is your heart burning? Will you be ready to see his face? Friends, Jesus is the reason for thanksgiving. He's the ultimate example of love and sacrifice. His grace is sufficient for you and for me. And as you surrender your life to follow Jesus Christ every morning, his Holy Spirit will fill you and change you your life will bless and encourage others. You will experience the assurance of salvation and the joy of the Lord. And that's what you can include in your prayer. Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation. You will, let's praise him together right now. So I'm, let's go to Psalm 118, 28 and 29. It's a beautiful prayer and song of praise. Let's repeat this together in unison and, and make this the prayer of our hearts, the praise of our hearts. Everyone together, you are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Praise God. That's the God we serve. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray?
Lord Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice. Lord, let us offer sacrifices of thanksgiving each day. In the name of Jesus, we pray this. Amen.